Open your Bibles, please, to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We're well over halfway through the book, and we only have four chapters to go, and this is the longest one of them. And there's some great things in here, but before I start expounding on this chapter, I want to read something to you from our brother Alvain Smith in South Africa that he wrote in response to my sermon that I preached last Sunday. Hi, Pastor. We are very thankful to God that you were given the strength for today's sermon. It was very timeous. Now, that word kind of threw me there, but it is correct. Apparently, it's something the British use, and they learned the British English. It means timely. It was very timeous and very rich with blessings. I inquired of Jared, that would be my son-in-law, and he said, the picnic went very well and the fellowship was outstanding. I'm very glad to hear. And indeed it was. We do yearn to be closer to the church. Remember I preached that? That have at least that yearning. It's so good to hear this. We do yearn to be closer to the church and I am of the conviction that no matter what, if we can move there to be closer to the church and offer our bodies as a worthy living sacrifice, it will be a very small price to pay. We dearly miss you all, exclamation point, God bless all vain. And uh, we miss them too. Long that they be closer. Ecclesiastes 9. Remember Solomon is on this, has this research project to find out what is that good that the sons of men should do all the days of their life under the sun. And he says, For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare this, to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God, and no man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. First of all, uh, Solomon in the verses in these verses that follow is going to expound on one event that comes unto all, good, bad, indifferent, and that is death. That's the one thing that we can surely count on happening in the future if our Lord Jesus tarries. We will die. But observe that he says, for all this, look at everything that Solomon has declared to us so far. He says, for all this, he first considered in his heart. That word consider means to meditate, to think upon, to study. For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this. So before Solomon declared, he first considered. It's really important. It's always best to think attentively in our heart upon that which we want to declare with our mouth, rather than being rash, acting without due consideration with our mouth. And that's why we have a verse like this in Psalm 19, 14. To, he said, let the meditation of my heart, that's a consideration of my heart, be acceptable. Let the words of my mouth, let me get a whole verse, let the words of my mouth and the meditation, the consideration of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I want you to notice that the consideration in the heart goes with the words of the mouth. The problem is too often we speak words with our mouth that we do not think about what we're saying. We say things thoughtlessly and later have to regret it. And this is especially true of the preacher. Solomon is a preacher, remember, that's the way this whole book is introduced, the words of the preacher, the king uh, over Israel in Jerusalem. Solomon was a king and he was also a preacher. And we've seen from this book a philosopher and a scientist. The man had a superior intellect beyond anybody excepting the Lord Jesus Christ. But this preacher thought about what he was going to say before he said it. Uh, in the primitive Baptist denomination that I came up in, there were those that felt like that when a man preached, he just got up and God funneled it through him. That you didn't need to study and think about what you were going to say before you said it. That is so wrong. This man was a preacher and he considered, he really thought over before he declared. And I try to do the same thing. A lot of these sermons that I preach to you, I preach to myself before I ever get up here and preach them, mulling it over in my mind what it is I want to say. And so he considered in his heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. Now, 
as we go further in this chapter, Solomon is going to be considering some things that have perplexed the righteous and the wise. Things just can't quite figure out about why things are happening the way they are. But before he does this, before he gets to the thing that perplexes, he first of all establishes something that always holds true no matter what happens. He gets that nailed down first, something that always holds true. He comes back to the basics, to the constants, and we have to always hold to these. The fundamental basic facts we know about God. You never want to let those slip, even though there's things around you happening that you cannot figure out, and you don't understand why God is doing what He's doing or allowing what He's allowing. allowing. Always come back to these constants, and you're going to see this pattern of holding to these constants in the face of perplexing circumstances in several places in your Bible. Uh, commenting on this, Matthew Henry said, Job, before he discourses on this matter, lays down the doctrine of God's omniscience in Job 24.1, and he does. In Job 24.1, he's going to talk about the prosperity of the wicked, and how they live long, and, and he just doesn't understand why God would let them get by with what they're doing, and even enjoy life to the degree that they do. But before he even goes there, he starts out with, why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know Him not see His days? So, before he even wrestles with the question, he sets forth the fact that God knows everything that's going on. God knows nothing, no times are hidden from the Almighty. Then Jeremiah does the same thing, except he sets forth the doctrine of God's righteousness. In Jeremiah 12, 1, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee. Yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they that are all they happy that deal very treacherously? I don't get that. They're wicked. Why are they happy? Why are they prospering? But even though he's asking the question and he's perplexed by what he sees, he starts out with this. Whether I understand it or not, God is right. God is righteous. Nothing is hidden from him. And then you come over to Habakkuk. He also is perplexed, yet he establishes that he, the holiness of God in the little prophecy of Habakkuk in uh, chapter, chapter 1. <clears throat> in verse 13, Thou art to purer eyes than to behold evil. See, that's a statement of God's holiness and canst not look on iniquity. Now the perplexity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth a man that is more righteous than he? That was his perplexity. Why would a man be able to devour a man that's more righteous than he? Why would God let that happen? But even in the face of that, he establishes that God is holy. And then the psalmist in Psalm 73 and verse 1 establishes that of God's goodness and peculiar favor to his own people. And then goes on and explains his perplexity about the prosperity of the wicked, not understanding why God lets that happen like he does. Psalm 73, 1, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of, of a clean heart. And so here, Solomon fastens upon and resolves to abide by that though good and evil seem to be dispensed promiscuously, yet God has a particular care and concern for his own people. They and their works are in his hand. So in case you got lost in that train of thought, let me pull it together for you and tell you what I just told you. And that is whenever you look in things in life that don't seem fair and you are perplexed by what you see, you always come back to these constants. This never changes. And that is God knows everything. God is righteous. God is holy. And God is good to his own people and has special to his own people. And nothing but nothing that happens changes that. You always want to come back to those constants, those basic things that you know about God, because nothing that happens in this world changes who and what God Almighty is. And so, whatever happens, of good or bad in your life, if you are God's child, 
and you are serving God, he has you and his works in his hand. That's why I selected the first hymn that I did this morning. By his own hand, he leadeth me. Let me give you three verses about being in God's hand, you and what you do. In Deuteronomy 33 and verse 3, Deuteronomy 33 and verse 3, Yea, he loved the people. God loves his people. And all his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words. But the thing I'm after is that God's saints are in his hand. In his hand. And then Psalm 31, 15. Psalm 31, 15. My times are in thy hand. Whatever times you're going through in your life, good times, bad times, young times, old times, they're all in the hand of God. They never escape that hand. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. And then lastly, those familiar words in the Gospel of John chapter 10 and verse 29. John 10, 29. Jesus, speaking of his people under the name of the sheep, said, My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. If you are in the hand of God, there is nobody that can pull you out of that. You are there, safe and secure. So whatever happens to you, come back to this constant that Solomon comes back to before he deals with these things that he can't quite figure out or that perplex him and often perplex the righteous. And that is, this stands, the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. Which means you will never be forgotten. You're in his hand. And neither will you go without your reward. Because your works are in his hand. And they will never be allowed to spill out. Two verses to show that neither you nor your works will be forgotten. Inasmuch as they are in the hand of God. Come to Isaiah 49, 14. Isaiah 49, 14. That's the comfort, is that no matter what happens, God hasn't forgotten you. You think he has sometimes. You think he doesn't know what's going on. You think he's not paying attention. You think, you think he's forsaken and forgotten you, that you are in his hands, speaks otherwise. In Isaiah 49, 14, But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. Yet I will not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands, and thy walls are continually before me. God has you graven in the palms of his hand. You're in that hand. And you will not be forgotten. And you will not be forsaken. And then as far as whatever good you do, your works, they're in the hands of God too. And these are the works of the righteous and wise. So we may assume from that that these are the works that flow out of that righteousness and that wisdom. And they too are in the hand of God. In Hebrews 6.10, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Man will forget. In fact, before we get done with this chapter, we're going to have a story told us about a poor wise man that delivered his city, and yet he was forgotten. Been there, done that. You do for people, you sacrifice for people, and then it's like they just forget it. But God doesn't. Even though what you do in kindness for another may not be remembered, and that person may later on turn and become an enemy to you, forgetting everything you ever did on their behalf, God will remember, and God will reward. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, as men often are. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. 
I like to think of Jeremiah as an example of this. The vast majority of the people to whom Jeremiah preached did not listen to him. He had to stand by and watch the destruction of his nation when he warned them of its approach and what they could do to prevent it, and they did not listen to him. I do not doubt, in fact, that was his perplexity in chapter 12, is why did it look like the wicked were taking root and prospering and increasing, and here I am trying to do the right thing, and they're trying to kill me. And he couldn't quite figure that out. I'm just doing what you told me to do, Lord. So he might have had those times, in fact, he did have those times, when he questioned why he was even doing what he was doing. It, it, it could, I could see him thinking that his ministry would amount to nothing. And yet we read his prophecy to this day, thousands of years later. And every time a communion service is observed, the prophet Jeremiah is quoted when we say this is the blood of the New Testament. Who told us about that New Testament? Who called it the New Covenant? It was the prophet Jeremiah. And to this very day, we use some verses in Jeremiah to prove to people and to convert them to the doctrine of sovereign grace. Uh, one of those verses will come up a little while later that is often used to show the inability of man by an act of his own will to save himself. So while for the present Jeremiah's ministry looked forsaken and forgotten, it was not. It was in the hand of God and is being made use of even to this day. So never forget that, people. And if you are in the hand of God, I've got good news for you. Great glory awaits you. In Isaiah 62, 3, Isaiah 62, 3, speaking to God's people, he says, in Isaiah 62, 3, Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. So always remember, no matter what happens, the righteous, their work, and the righteous and the wise and their work are in the hand of God. And in the context of that statement, he makes this interesting statement. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. Learn this and never forget it. You cannot judge whether you are loved of God or hated of God. And that's, you're one or the other. God loves you or God hates you. And the Bible teaches there's some people he loves and some people he hates. We all know the, the, the text that most classically states this, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, quoted from Malachi 1 into Romans chapter 9. And so, but you cannot judge whether God loves you or hates you by the things that are before you, that is by your outward circumstances. Your outward circumstances may be ever so prosperous and God may hate you and you'll find that out in the day of judgment. Or your circumstances outwardly may be ever so adverse and yet you may be one of God's beloved and favorite. So you cannot judge by what's before you whether you are loved or hated of God. Always remember that, people. It's so important. And, and, well, let me come to that point in a moment. Let me get this next thing. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. All things come alike to all. Boy, is that ever true. Uh, is, uh, in, in, in commenting on this, I, I, I again cite Matthew Henry. He said, is David rich? <laughs> so is Nabal. Nabal was that fool. That fool that wouldn't even help David's men when they were out wandering in exile. He was a fool, but he was rich. Is David rich? So is Nabal. Is Joseph, the story of Joseph in your Old Testament, favored by his prince? Remember how Pharaoh exalted him to be second in command over the whole empire of Egypt? Is Joseph favored by his prince? So is Haman. That's in the book of Esther. He was one of the most wicked characters in all history, but his king favored him. Is Ahab a wicked king, killed in battle? Yeah. So is Josiah, one of the best in the Bible record. A bad king, a good king, both of them killed in battle. Are bad figs, figs being representative of bad people, in this case, bad figs, bad people, good figs, good people. It's a, it's a, it's a picture that Jeremiah was given in Jeremiah chapter 24 to differentiate between the good and bad in his nation. Are bad figs carried into captivity or carried to Babylon? Yes, but so are the good. So you can see, 
<laughs> good and bad happening to good and bad alike. All things come alike to all. But even though good things come to good people and bad people, and bad things come to good people and bad things come to bad people, all things come alike to all, even though that happens, even though you look at the outward circumstances, and sometimes you can't discern a difference in the outward circumstances, it does not erase the eternal distinction between good and evil, the righteous and the wicked, and the wise and the foolish. That remains. No matter what happens, you're either right or wrong. You're either good or bad. You're either foolish or wise. No matter what happens to you. Do you understand that? Those moral distinctions are eternal moral distinctions that, that will continue throughout all eternity. And so it always pays to be among the righteous, the wise, and the good, no matter what happens in your outward circumstances. That distinction remains. So if we want to know whether God loves us or not, do not look to your outward circumstances. That's not where you're going to find it out. You have to look within. What's going on in your heart? What are you in here? Not what's going on out there, but what are you in here? That's how you will know whether you love God or not. And if we from our heart love God, then we may certainly know that God loves us. As we read in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19. You see people, what you are in here is what you are. No matter what's happening to you out there. If bad things happening to a person means that person is hated of God and that person is not right with God, then one of the most classic examples would be the Apostle Paul. He didn't stand a chance because lots and lots of bad things happened to this noble man of God that loved God and served him greatly. You can't judge that by outward circumstances. 1 John 4, 19 says we love him because he first loved us. If we from our heart love God, then we can know that God loves us. If from our heart we believe and trust in God, then we may know from that that God loves us. If from our heart we yearn to know God, we yearn to please God, we yearn to serve God, and we yearn to be where it is at, as I said last Sunday, then from that we may know we are loved of God. Because we are yearning for that which delights the heart of God. You've got to look inside. If from our heart we hate sin, then we may know from this that we are loved of God. But in that same epistle of 1 John, he said in chapter 2 and verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So again, you've got to look at what's going on down here. How much in here do you love that world out there? as opposed to God, His Word, and the things of God, and the people of God, and the house of God. Now, I want to just add this thought. It's not in your outline. Because we're talking in Ecclesiastes about what's in the hand of God. So we move from that thought to apply this love or hatred to God. No man knoweth either, we could add, the love of God or the hatred of God by all that is before him. But inasmuch as it's not specified love of God or hatred of God, it's just said love or hatred, let me just now take that one step further. There are a lot of people that say with their lips outwardly that they love God. You could ask them, do you love God? And they would say, yes, I love God. And they will open their mouth in church and they will sing, oh, how I love Jesus. But truthfully, all that's just what Jesus talked about in Matthew 15 and in Mark 7. Those that draw near with their lips, but their heart is far from him. The truth is that while they may outwardly say they love God, may outwardly go through the motions that would demonstrate that even maybe being a member of the church, but dig down deep in the heart and the truth is they love what's out there more than they love what's in here. And that's, that's why we all need to search our hearts. I, read, I, I was just rereading this this morning. It occurred to me as I was thinking about what I was going to say today of something over here in the, um, 
in the book of Isaiah that um, he talked about those that uh, delight to know his ways but don't in truth. Um, yes, it's Isaiah 58. That's where it is. Where Isaiah opens up and he says, cry aloud and spare not. He's telling the prophet in this particular case to cut it loose and yell. Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice, which is what you do when you're projecting more like a trumpet. And a trumpet is loud. And show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinances of God, of the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. But you go on and read further and you will see that all of this was really just for show, to make a good impression, to get other people off the scent of what they really are in their hearts. So it pays all of us to do some heart searching. Do I really love God? Do I, when I pray, do I just utter rote words to be able to say I did it? Or do I really consciously talk to God? Because I want God working and involved in my life. I want to relate to God. And when I read His Word, do I do it with a passion to want to know God and learn of God? And when I come to church, do I want to have an encounter with God? Do I do this because from my heart I want to please God? Or do I do it because I don't want the pastor fussing at me about being absent? I mean, do you see? See what I'm saying? What's it really for? And, and, and somebody might kind of go through the, go through the motions but, but lack the heart and yet everything's going wonderfully in their life and so they think, well, God must love me. Look at how wonderful everything is. Oh, don't go there. You don't know love or hatred by all that is before you. You got to look at what's going on within you. Because sad but true, there are hypocrites in Zion that put on a show but lack the reality of what it is to be a Christian. And so this verse is a very searching verse. Now, there's one event to all, he says. All things come alike to all. And there is one event. Let's read verse 2. To the righteous and to the wicked. This is something that happens to them both. To the good and to the clean and to the unclean. Happens to both kinds. To him that sacrificeth and to him that sacrificeth not. As is the good, so is the sinner. As he that sweareth, as he that feareth an oath. There is an evil among all things that are done under the sun. This one event he calls here an evil happens to all kind of folks, good and bad. People that go to church, people that don't go to church, people that give, people that don't give. It happens to them all. One event. And that one event, and he will talk about this further, is death. Uh, You've you got a parallel verse that will help to nail this. Because remember, all the answers aren't always found in a single passage. You've got to compare Scripture with Scripture and fill in what may not be stated in one passage. God wrote His Word like that. He wrote His Word so that to really understand it, you've got to study it. Compare this with this. Dig in there. See, He wrote it to challenge you to dig to find out. He will find out how much you really want to know Him by so constructing His truth that you'll have to do some brain sweat and make some effort to figure it out. In Psalm 49 and verse 10, For He seeth, Psalm 49, 10, that wise men die, yeah, likewise the fool, and the brutish person perish. Brutish means stupid and leave their wealth to others. Wise and fool, good, bad, they all die. We all die. One event. As it is said in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, which gives the lie to reincarnation, that you live and die several times, going through several different lives, until finally you get purged of all your bad karma, and you go up into nirvana, which is absolute, absolute dribble, dribble error, whatever you want to call it. A, Got to think of a word acceptable in a pulpit. <laughs> but there's all kind of words that could be used to describe it. 
But in Isaiah, or Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, and as it is appointed unto man once to die, see not several times, but once, but after this the judgment, death is a, carries a finality with it. And we'll see that as we move on in Hebrews, or, or Ecclesiastes chapter 9. But there it is. It is appointed once to die. This is that one event. And he cites it as an evil among all things that are done under the sun. Of all the things that happen, and all the things that are done under the sun, dying is one evil that's common to us all. And it is something you do. You die. Now, death appears an evil thing to us. Because look at what he's just told us. It mows down the religious and the irreligious alike. No matter how we live, we all come to the same end. We die. And even though we who are Christians have a hope in Christ of a life after death, a life beyond death, beyond the sun, even with a hope in Christ, we still view one's death as something evil. Because evil in the Bible not only refers to moral evil, like adultery and drunkenness and fornication and lying and stealing and so forth, but it also refers to, bad, to, to painful things, hurtful things that happen to us, like fires and destruction and, and pain. All of these things come under the heading of evil. There is moral evil and there is what we could call circumstantial evil. And that is exactly what death is to us. How many times when we receive word of someone's death do we say, that's too bad? Hmm? And even when a person is ready to die, and when it would actually be a relief to see them die, it still brings us pain. I was ready for my mother to die. I had watched my mother losing herself for years with Alzheimer's disease. I long lost the mother I knew before my mother finally died. It was painful. It was this long, protracted grief. Those of you that have lost loved ones to Alzheimer's know exactly what I'm talking about. A long, protracted grief. You see that person slowly fade away and die till they finally do indeed die. I wanted my mother to die. I was ready for my mother to die because watching what her life was was painful. Every time we drop her off, it seems like we would just talk about how pitiful my mother was. But when she finally died, let me tell you, I cried bitter tears. It hurt because even there was so little left, it was still my mother. It was still my mother and it hurt to see her die. And it's an, so from that standpoint, from the standpoint of the pain, even though there is a relief in the death of one that suffers for so long, it still hurts. It's still an evil that is done under the sun. But that's not the only thing. This one event, this evil that is done under the sun, there's another one. Yea, also Let's just add this to that one event that happens to all. And actually, this is the reason <laughs> that one event happens to all. Yea, and there's no doubt about this one also. The heart of the sons of men is full of evil. And madness is in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. So add to the evil of universal death this evil, that the hearts of the sons of men is full of evil. There is moral evil. This is Solomon's assessment of the human part, heart, and this is what it is, apart from the grace of God. This is what the human heart is by nature until God does that great heart transplant when he takes out the hard and stony heart and he puts in a heart of flesh that is impressionable to his word and his truth and is capable of loving him truly. In Genesis 6, 5, early on God gave us this same assessment of the human heart. It was this heart full of evil that brought on the flood of Noah. In Genesis 6, 5, Genesis 6, 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil 
continually. I want you to let those words sink in. Every imagination, only evil continually. You know what that's telling you? They never thought a good thought. And when you look at the depravity of man and the depravity of the human heart, even what we might call good thoughts are tainted with selfishness, self-seeking. They're tainted in some way or another. Even their religious thoughts are tainted unless washed in the blood of the Lamb and experiencing the change of the grace of God. This is why the idea that a person can be saved, some wicked, ungodly sinner can be saved by some act of his heart, really? When his heart, every imagination is only evil continually? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? And man's heart by nature is unclean, full of it, full of it. There's no good in there to bring out. The only way a man will be saved is for God, God to do something, because he doesn't have it in him to do. Even our righteousnesses before God are as filthy rags apart from Jesus Christ. And so you have that. Now look at after the flood. Let's see if the flood cleaned man's heart. It cleansed the earth. It flushed down a lot of wickedness and flushed down the works of the wicked. It, it cleansed the earth. But did it cleanse the heart of man? Well, we shall see. In Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21, the Lord smelled a sweet savour, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. As soon as you can start thinking, you start thinking things you shouldn't think. It is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. The flood cleansed the environment. It cleansed the earth, but it didn't clean up man. Man came out on the other side just as evil as he was when he went into it. They call our prison systems... Um, Places where prisoners get rehabilitated. Not. Not without a change of heart. Not. And so there you have it. And then lastly, I told you we'd get to this. This verse in Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17, again, made often use of to establish the doctrine of man's total depravity and therefore inability to do anything to save himself by any act of work, any act of will, the will coming out of the heart. The Bible talks about the willing heart. Well, apart from the grace of God, we have an unwilling heart as far as God is concerned. For we read in verse 9 of Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things. You can't trust it. You hear people saying all the time, trust your heart. That's the worst thing you can do. Don't trust your heart. Your heart will mislead you. He that trusteth in his own heart, Solomon said, is a fool. Trust what God said, not what you feel or what you think. Or your heart will deceive you. You trust what God Almighty said. The heart is deceitful above all things. And not only wicked, but desperately wicked. I mean, the heart really, really wants to be bad in a desperate way. And again, the only hope for us is a change of heart wrought in us by an act of God. It's the heart of the sons of men is full of evil and madness is in their heart. And folks, I'm here to tell you that because of the fall of man and the pollution of sin, every man, ourselves included, has some kind of mental and emotional warp. None of us is fully sound and balanced psychologically. None of us, including myself. We've all got some psychological, emotional warp in us that we struggle with day in and day out. Amen. And we all do. All got something twisted, bent, perverted in every single one of us that we need the help of God to deal with. 
And even though God changes our heart, and even though God gives us eternal life, and God puts His Spirit within us, we still have a brain that's been damaged by the fall, and we're going to have to use what God gives us to try to bring that under control. You're never going to make it all go away. You bring it under control. And it'll go away when Jesus comes back and gives you a new brain with a new body. Then, then, and only then, will all of us be completely sound psychologically. So in the meantime, the heart of the sons of men is full of evil and madness is in their heart while they live. And so we live our crazy life down here, and then we die. We die. You know what, my, I've told you before what my wife said. She said it takes you about 70 to 80 years to learn how to live. Things start to click. About 70 or 80 years, you finally figure out that the songwriter was right. God will take care of you. You finally figure out, you know, no matter what you read in the media, no matter what they conspire, no matter what the government is up to, it's been up to evil before. God's going to take care of you. And you're just going to muddle through it the best you can and exercise the best judgment you can. And yes, you will make mistakes. You will, but God will take care of you. You kind of figure that out. You learn as you go along, one day at a time. Life by the inch is a cinch, but life by the yard is hard. And so you, you, it takes you about 70 or 80 years. You finally figure that out and you die. Just about the time you catch on, you die. What does that say for how slow we are to learn and to catch on and then you die? But I, I have a good way I look at that. And that is, you know, it's true that when you finally learn the lessons and you finally pass the test, you graduate to the next grade or the ne you graduate. And so we just graduate to glory once we've learned the lessons. Because one of the lessons we learn <laughs> is that we're never going to make this world a better place to live. When you're young, you're going to make it a better place to live. You get about middle age and, well, you finally reconcile. You're not going to make it a better place to live, so you're going to try to just get through it the best you can. And then you get older and it's like, get me out of here. The sooner the better. <laughs> I'm not going to fix this place. Oh, no. Oh, no. Now, considering this wretched condition of man that he has stated in verse 3, he makes an interesting statement. He moves to our wretchedness to something very interesting. He says in verse 4, For to him that is joined to all living, and that's every one of us in this room this morning, we are still joined to the living. We're all still among folks that are still alive. Everybody in this room is still alive. We are still joined to all the living. And to us that are joined to all the living, there's hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Let me just comment on this first. Considering the wretched condition of man, he just stated in verse 3, he comes to the interesting thought that there are advantages to still being alive on this world. in this world. There are advantages... Now, this is interesting because it's an opposite view to what we heard him take in chapter 4 in verse 2. Opposite view. But again, it isn't that Solomon is, is a man contradicting himself. It's just that it's perspective. If you look at it from one way, then mm. you look at it another way, then oh, okay. In Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 2, he said, I praise the dead which were already dead more than the living which are yet alive. But here, he's saying that to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. First of all, let's just look at that in terms of natural life, breathing and staying alive. As long as there's life, we always have the prospect of it being prolonged. This is why the sick try one treatment after another. And they do, because as long as they're alive, they have this hope that can prolong their life if they try this or if they try that. I mean, we have, the classic example of that was Greg Ole. I mean, the man had colon cancer in the year 2000, survived that surgery, went about 15 years, and then it finally came back on him with a vengeance. And for those of us that knew him and knew something about his treatment plan, it amounted to this. 
try everything conceivable. He tried everything but the kitchen sink and I wouldn't be surprised if somebody had seen him trying to eat that or lick it or whatever. He would have done it if he thought it would have helped him. He tried every kind of a treatment you can nearly imagine. Now why did he do that? Because as long as he was living and breathing, he had a hope that he could still live and he had a strong will to live. He, 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 Greg Ole amazed. His, his oncologist called him his miracle patient. He far and away survived the odds. Odds being what they are, he should have been dead long before he was. I mean, I preached his funeral in my mind so many times before he finally died, thinking I'd see him one Sunday and think it can't be much longer. I mean, he'd come back the next Sunday looking like a million dollars. You know, you know what I'm saying? It beat anything I've ever seen. I lay Greg's longevity to three things principally. Number one, his faith in God. Number two, a cheerful attitude. And number three, a will to live. And I always knew that if he ever lost that will to fight, it wouldn't be long. And when he was last in the hospital, and let me tell you something I know. When he went in that hospital the last time with that problem with the stoma, there was at first mention of possibly doing a surgery, he was going to go along with it. If it would prolong his life, he was going to go along with it. And then the doctor came in and said there was no way they could do that. There was nothing that they could do. And essentially told him to go home, make the best of what time you have left because you're going to die. Jesus is coming for you. And that's where Greg Ole quit fighting. That's where he gave up. One month, he was gone. I knew it would be like that. Once he lost that will to fight, in one month, hey, look, I was standing right there when Shannon said, I'm ready to let nature take its course. I'm done. One week. One week. One week. Amazing, isn't it? But you see, as long as you've got some idea that you can prolong your life, you'll go for it. That's one of the things that keeps us alive. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. But let's take it as Christians in our understanding a little bit further. As long as a person is alive, there's always that possibility that their heart may be changed by God so that he comes to have hope in God and thus in an afterlife. I don't care how wicked he is today. There have been the most wicked of men that God has visited with his salvation and they've changed. People change. We've seen it. We've got a room full of people like that. That's what we all are by grace. So as long as, a, and that's what I was trying to say the other day. You, you look like, for example, at those police that came to arrest that pastor in, in Alberta. And before you just start cursing them and, 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 and unleashing all these invectives at these horrible police that came to do this horrible thing, remember the Apostle Paul did that very same kind of thing prior to his conversion. And you, we see what God did to him. You see, as long as a person is alive, there's always that possibility something's going to happen to change their course. Something is going to happen to give them hope of a better life beyond and us hope that they have a better life beyond. To all the living, Join to all the living, there is hope. That is why Paul said to people that are married to unconverted persons in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians 7, 16, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? There's always that possibility as long as we're joined to the living. But once a person is dead... That's it. That's it. You can't hope for them to live any longer in this world, nor can you hope for a change of heart once they're dead. It's not, they're not, it's, it's done. It's done. And so he says a living dog is better than a dead lion. <laughs> um, a lion is much stronger than a dog. A lion is the king of beasts. Proverbs 30 and verse 30, The lion which is strongest among beasts, and turneth not away for any. A lion has strength far in excess 
of a dog. But I'll tell you what, a living dog's got more strength than a dead lion. Because <laughs> one thing that happens when you die is you lose all your strength. The dead have no power. The dead have no strength. So, hey, if you got to choose between being a living dog and a dead lion, choose the living dog. And then he says, for the living know that they shall die. At least one thing can be said for people that are still alive is they know they're going to die. <laughs> but the dead, <laughs> they know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten. So living people at least know this much that they shall die and other people know them. They know something. And the knowledge that they shall die is a very wholesome knowledge for any man to have. We are going to die and we need to know we are going to die. For as long as we know we are going to die, that means we are not dead yet. Now, that's brilliant. <laughs> I know, you know, I want to take a sip of water, and I want you to think about that, because that, that would really challenge your brain. That was deep. The more I study the Word of God, the more I learn deep, wonderful mysteries and dark sayings and sentences. If you know... I'll say it again now so you can get it. If you know you are going to die, you are not dead yet. And that's a good knowledge. And it's a good knowledge to maintain because properly processed, that knowledge should be a motive in how you order your life. And it should induce you to consider what really matters in this world. Do you get that? Knowing you would, shall die should induce you to consider what really matters in this world. I guarantee you that the nearer Greg got to death, the more things came into perspective for him as to what really is important versus what isn't. We all know it is no secret that Greg was a great fan of the Buckeyes. But his fanaticism for the Buckeyes waned. And he saw with each, the nearer death came to him, the more he realized how really, in the larger scheme of things, how very unimportant that is and how it doesn't. You know what that guy asked me the time before the last? He said, why do you dislike the Buckeyes so? I said, well, why do you dislike the Wolverines so? That was the end of the conversation. <laughs> And we had fun with that. That's what it was. Because really in the larger scheme of things it doesn't matter. But again this idea that you know you're going to die. That should have a very good effect on all of us. Uh, Charles Bridges commenting on this said the glory and great end of life. The thing you want to aim at more than anything else is that life which makes it gain to die. You want to live and have a relationship with God that is such that you have garnered in a what the Bible calls a full assurance of faith and a full assurance of hope that when you look at death, you look at it as a gain, just like the Apostle Paul did. Knowing you shall die, that should make induce you to want to live so that you view death as a gain. But he goes on and says that the dead have uh, no knowledge. And neither have they any more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. The dead not, they, uh, and of course this refers to knowledge and reward in this world, not in the next. Obviously the soul and spirit certainly know they're in either heaven or hell. This is talking about the body, the dead body knows nothing. As far as this world, they know no more. As far as this world, they have no more any reward. They're not going to draw any more paychecks, no more checks from Social Security. Will they be able to cash? It's done. Uh, kind of like Job said in Job chapter 7, commenting on what it's like to be dead. In case you're wondering, and would like to find out. In Jeremiah 7, 8, or Jeremiah, I'm sorry, Job. Job 7, 8 through 10. The eye of him, Job said, that hath seen me shall see me no more. That's what happens. You die and you get put in your grave and we just don't see you anymore. I mean, how many people we used to see sitting out in this congregation and we don't see them anymore? 
The eye of him that has seen me shall see me no more, and thine eyes are upon me, and I am not. As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more, and he shall return no more to his house. And neither shall the place, his place, whatever his seat was in this church, shall know him no more. Agreeing with what Solomon says here, that uh, they know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. And then this interesting thing he says in verse 6, and also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. That's talking about their existence in this world under the sun. They're done with it. They have no, they don't know what's going on down here, don't care about what's going on down here. Whatever impact they were going to make is made, and there's no coming back to undo anything that was done while they're here. And that realization should inspire all of us in how we order our lives, because once you're out of this world, it's done. Whatever impact you were going to make has been made. It's over. It's over. And their love and their hatred and their envy. And he mentions these three, three, three things. And think about those three things because they define much of our life. The things you love, the things you hate, and those you envy define much about how you live in this world. Love of God and hatred of sin makes a big difference in how you live, doesn't it? If you love God and hate sin, it makes a big difference in the choices you make and the shaping of your character, but the reverse is equally true. The more you love sin and don't love God, that also shapes what you are. And in I, and your love of others, your, or your hatred of others, or your envy of others is going to influence how you treat them. So much of life is shaped by those three things. And as far as that envy bit, the Bible says the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. Every single one of us has a problem to some degree of feeling some ill will and struggling with some ill will when we see somebody that's better than we are in character or in skills or knowledge or whatever. There is that insecurity that we all have within ourselves that when someone outstrips us, it makes us question ourselves and even often resent that person that does it. It's there. And so your life is going to be defined on whether you let that take over and control you or whether you manage it and keep it under. And how much you love God and hate sin is going to have everything to do with what you do with that thing that's inside of all of us that we struggle with. But when we die, that's over. All the love all the hatred, all the envy is now perished. And the dead have no more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. They have no more any part in any activity of any kind in this world. You see, once we quit this world and what it has to offer, we quit it forever. When your body comes out of that grave, it's not coming out of that grave to keep living down here. It's done with this world. When you leave this world, it's over as far as this world is concerned. So while you're living, folks, make the best of it you can. And then, Brendan, how long have I been up here? Uh, 57. Minutes. 57. Take a deep breath. Let me, let me give you a little bit more here as we grind our way through this. We have longer sermons here. <laughs> And so, verse 7, I love this. Go thy way. Eat thy bread with joy. Drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white, and let thy head lack no ointment. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life which the dead have no more, and in the labor which thou takest under the sun. So the preacher is giving some advice to how best to live under the sun all the days of our vanity. And our life is a vanity. I mean, it's here for a moment and gone. It's really very brief. 
And so how to make the best of this brief life that's going to end in death. And he gives this advice to a certain class of people. This isn't necessarily applicable to out, people outside this class. And it's those of whom it can be said, For God now accepteth thy works. These are those that do well in the eyes of God. God now accepteth thy works. And if he does, then go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart and let your garments be always white and thy head like no ointment. In other words, enjoy life. For God now accepteth thy works. Now, now, now look at Genesis 4, 7, this thing about God accepteth thy works now. The, this is describing people that do well in the eyes of God. Because if you're not doing well in the eyes of God, God's not accepting your works. He's rejecting them. So one thing we want, brethren, one thing we want is that right now, right now, this moment, 11-13, 15th of August, 2021, we want to be sure right now that God is accepting what we're doing. And again, whether God is accepting what you're doing right now depends on what's going on down here. <laughs> the reason you're here and what you hope to accomplish by being here. But in Genesis 4, 7, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And then Romans 12, 2. Romans 12, 2, speaking to us as Christians. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, what's acceptable to God is what God has expressed to us in His Word that is His will for our life. And then lastly, Ephesians 5, 8 through 10. Ephesians 5, 8 through 10. For we, ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light, and the Lord walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. What's acceptable to God? That kind of stuff. Goodness, righteousness, truth. This is the kind of stuff God accepts. And so he says, God is now accepting your works. That being the case, enjoy your life. Enjoy your life. Because you see, obedience to God, listen, here's the point you can draw from this, sanctifies the pleasures of life. It makes them okay. It sanctifies the pleasures of life. However, how can you really enjoy such pleasures as bread and wine and your wife and clean garments and ointment on you? How can you really enjoy the pleasures of life when you are feeling guilt over unforsaken sin? How can you really? I'll give you some verses that will show you this. And you can probably look within your own life when you've had unforsaken sin in your life. How when you try to enjoy something, it's like you don't feel entitled to do so. That is if your heart is right with God. In Jeremiah 20, 12 through, pardon me, Job. Job 20, Job 20, 12 through 14. Though wickedness be sweet in his mouth. Talking about a wicked person. Though he hide it under his tongue. I mean, for the moment, he's enjoying that wicked thing he's doing. Because there is pleasure in sin. That's why people do it. Though wickedness be sweet in his mouth, and though he hide it under his tongue, though he spare it and forsake it not, but keep it still within his mouth, yet his meat in his bowels is turned. It is the gall of asps within him. His digestive system is all out of whack because his life is out of whack. There was a woman in this church. This was many, many, many years ago in the early days of my pastorate that it was later found out she was having an affair she was cheating on her husband. And I called her on the phone one day. I don't even remember what I called her for. And I left a message for her to call me. And she called me back. What is this? She said her stomach was churning. Churning. Because the pastor called her and wanted her to call him back. Well, <laughs> I know why her stomach was churning. Because she was scared to death I'd found out. See? See, that illustrates the point. See... Obedience sanctifies the pleasures, but disobedience spoils them. 
Look at Psalm 32 after David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Look at what was going on before he finally came to confession. He thought he had it hidden. And he was going on with his life. But all during that time, because David was a child of God, all during that time, before he finally fessed up, he says in Psalm 32, 3, When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, and my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. He was feeling guilt. Guilt. But he hadn't confessed it. But so while he kept silence, that guilt was working on him and it was having physical effects. And I'll give you one last verse. So this, this call that, that Solomon is giving for us to enjoy the pleasures of life is if our works are now accepted with God. If they are not, we need to fix that. And then we can address the pleasures of life with a clear conscience. Hosea 9.1, Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy as other people. For thou hast gone a whoring from thy God. Thou hast loved a reward upon every corn floor. So since they were so unfaithful and gone a whoring from God, they weren't entitled to joy as other people. And he's calling them to mourning rather than to rejoicing. Get, get your works right. And so this is letting us know in this passage that our obedience to God is what sanctifies our pleasures. And then, go thy way. And I think I'll stop on this one. I just want to do this one. This one, I think this one's so good. And I'll stop on this one. Go thy way. Eat thy bread with joy. Enjoy your food. And drink thy wine with a merry heart. Enjoy a glass of wine. For God now accepteth our works. But I love the way it starts. I love this. Go thy way. You know what go thy way equals? Like when we say to somebody, get on with your life. Or get on with it. Go thy way. You see, when God bestows favors upon us, it's an incentive for us to get on with our life rather than get staying stuck in whatever pain, grief, or loss we have suffered. Get on with it. I'll show you something here. It's interesting. It, it, when I have looked at the book of Ecclesiastes, I have thought, this book is never quoted in the New Testament. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> I found that out. These words, go thy way, I'm going to show you a string of verses where Jesus said the same thing when he would relieve somebody, when he would perform a miracle, and he said, go thy way, go thy way. Just look at it very quickly, and we'll, we'll, we'll stop on this point. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 13, he heals a centurion servant. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way. Just what Solomon said. And as thou hast believed, so be it done to thee. Then in Mark chapter 7 and verse 29, he heals a... Um, 7.29, he, he's... Um, going to heal this woman's daughter that was vexed with the devil. And he said unto her, for this saying, go thy way, thy devil is gone out of thy daughter. And then in chapter 10 and verse 52, 52, Jesus said unto him, this is healing a blind man, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Uh, Luke 17, 19, you know, get on with it, get on with it. In Luke 17 and verse 19, he, Jesus says to the uh, leper that he's healed, there was a Samaritan. He says, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And lastly, in John 4 and verse 15, 50, when Jesus heals the daughter of uh, Jairus, the nobleman, whose daughter, was, or no, no, the nobleman whose son, Son was sick. I've got it mixed up. It's the nobleman, not Jairus. Jairus had his daughter healed, or actually raised from the dead. In John 4, uh, Jesus says to this uh, nobleman, he says, Go thy way, thy son liveth. Isn't that interesting? The Lord quotes Solomon, Go thy way. I say to everyone in this room, 
if God's done you a favor, if God's given you relief, if God's given you healing, or if you have sinned and you have confessed and God has sealed to your heart that that sin is forgiven, then get on with it. Don't just stay wallowing in the pain and the sorrow and the grief and the regret of the past. Get on with it. Go thy way. And if there's a remedy, avail yourself of it and get on with it like Pat Boucher said about that woman that didn't want to take the medicine that would have helped her. Take the damn medicine and get on with it. She didn't realize how she was speaking the language of Solomon. Do it and get on with it. <laughs> She'll never live that down. If God blesses me to preach her funeral, I'm going to announce it from the pulpit that she said it, and I want it chiseled on her tombstone. How true, how true. <laughs> Don't we all love Pat Boucher? I mean, she says it, she calls him like she sees him. And don't we miss Pat Boucher among all the rest. We miss them terribly. But anyway, I just think that's great. I wanted to get to that. Go thy way. God has blessed you. God now accepts your works. You know, whatever he wasn't accepting, if you've resolved it, if you've rectified it in his eyes and accept his healing forgiveness, pick up where you left off and go thy way and get on with it. We're not down here for very long, so make the best of it because once you're gone, you've done whatever you're going to do down here. And if God accepts your works now, that's putting you in good stead. You want to make sure that's true every day. Strive every moment to walk acceptable with your God so that when that last moment comes and you're done with this world, you'll have less to take to the judgment seat. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you.